What's up, Humble Theology fam? You've probably always heard the phrase, um, the image of God and how at the fall, the image of God was broken. Um, I just have a thought for you and I'm going to make this suggestion and then hopefully theologically, I'm going to prove this to you. I actually am going to hold and say that the image of God is not broken at the fall. <laughs> well, the image of God is retained. It is um, a status that is freely given to us that cannot be revoked. And yet it comes with a standard. And what ends up happening at the fall is not that the image of God is broken. It's that humanity is broken. Now, I know some of this is going to be like super shocking for you all because it has kind of become common language to talk about the broken image or how the image of God broke. And so um, I, I kind of want to really unpack, like, what does it actually mean to be made in the image of God? Why does this even matter? And then on top of all of that, what are the consequences or the implications for a belief that the image of God could actually be broken upon humanity? Because this question of the image of God is tightly knit to to the question of ethics. Now, what are ethics? The issue of ethics are the lived expectations, the lived reality of humanity in light of what God says ought to be right and what is wrong. So in that tension point of right living or wrong living is the question of ethics. So, so let's go all the way back to Genesis and let's kind of take a big 30,000 foot perspective. And I'm going to engage with some other scholarship so we can kind of see um, um, what's happening here. As sin enters into the world, the question is, what does it actually do to humanity? One view would hold that the image of God broke during the fall. And so humanity is really on this journey to reclaim this broken image. In a sense, the language and the phrasing of the Mago Dei, that's kind of the Latin phrase, as being broken has become incredibly common. So Charles Spurgeon, I love Spurgeon. Now, just because I mentioned Charles Spurgeon or other theologians who have a different view on this or perceive this different, differently, this isn't an attack upon them or a dismissal of all their incredible theological work. It just is my hope uh, that we are a bit more precise with our language. And, um, and I think it's important to identify that uh, there is no no one that has gotten it all right. Like I could be getting something wrong. Uh, and yet I want to just consider these things deeply. And so Charles Spurgeon said, the likeness and image of God was broken in them. The them refers to Adam and Eve immediately. And we are dead in trespasses and in sins by reason of their death. So for Spurgeon, the idea of the likeness and image of God, the fact that it's broken is directly connected to the death and the trespasses of sin. So here's just kind of a, um, a philosophical question. What if we said, um, instead of the likeness and the image of God, what if Spurgeon said um, the humanity of Adam and Eve was broken and immediately because of that human brokenness, they were dead in their trespasses and in their sins by reason of their death. Like, we'd be like, oh yeah, that still absolutely makes sense. Now, the question is, which one is more biblical? Which one is evidenced by scripture? Um, again, let's go to another uh, theologian, Arthur Pink. He says, originally the moral law was imprinted upon the very heart of human, of man. Adam and Eve were made in the image and likeness of God, Genesis, Genesis 1, 26 and 27 which among other things signifies that they were morally conformed unto their maker. Now notice that for Pink, he wants to connect morality with the image of God. Consequently, the very nature of unfallen man caused him to render loving and loyal obedience to his king. But when he fell, this was reversed. The image of God was broken and his likeness was greatly marred, though not completely effaced. And so for Pink, one of the things that he wants to kind of draw out is the sense that, yes, the image of God is broken, but it's not completely erased. It's not completely gone. Like there's still vestiges of the images that are there. Now, remember, I said there are consequences to our theological beliefs that typically flush themselves out in our ethics or our lived experience. So historically, there have actually been incredible errors that have made um, to the application that have been made to the application of this thought onto humanity. For instance, here are a couple. Slave traders rationalized and condoned the selling and buying of Africans because they were in the image of God to a lesser degree than Caucasians. All right. Um, here's another one. The implication 
of a broken image also works its way into the scenarios of humans born with some cognitive delay or disability. This is a serious one. Even the great theologian Martin Luther tragically advocated for the drowning of a, in quote, this is his words, in quote, a feeble-minded, end quote, 12-year-old child because evidence of his limited mental capacity revealed some sort of corruption of his reason and soul. This is what Luther suggested, right? So as you can see, our theology always goes hand in hand with our ethics and a lived theology that compromises the ethics of the kingdom of God is not good theology. The church historically equated the image of God with specific characteristics such as rationality or intellect, creativity, the ability to communicate or relate with others. Um, this is what Herman Bovink says. Um, on the content of the image of God, there was initially a wide range of opinions in the Christian church. At times, it was located in the human body. Then it was sometimes located in rationality. Then in the freedom of the will. Then again in the dominion mandate over the created world. Or also in the moral qualities, such as the evidence of love, justice, and things like that. End quote. Okay, if the image of God is connected to these attributes and broken, then it leads to a tragic conclusion that those that are born with any type of disability, cognitive, physical, um, or any type of mental health-related illness, either never had the image of God in the first place or somehow lost it because the image of God was broken. Hopefully you can see now what the ethical dilemma is of a uh, view that the image of God itself is broken at the fall. And, and the question is, like, is this ethical dilemma um, something that's substantiated by a biblical theological position? So here's where I want to kind of make a movement and I want to make this statement. Um, I want to suggest that the image of God is retained but humanity is broken at the fall. And in full disclosure, I'm getting the majority of this kind of theological trajectory from um, John Kilner, who is a brilliant theologian and a bioethicist. Um, his book, Dignity and Destiny, Humanity in the Image of God, was a significant influence on my reshaping and reforming and, and repositioning of the doctrine of the image of God. And so the language of status and standard, and even the imagery that I'm going to give of a blueprint, is really sourced from Dr. Kilner. Hey, Humble Theology fam. Um, it's kind of wild, but I wrote my very first book and it released earlier this year. It's called The Hidden Peace. Here it is right here. Uh, finding true security, strength, and confidence through humility. Uh, really what I wanted to do was write a book that was accessible for the everyday average Bible reader, but gave you some um, sound biblical theology on the ancient virtue of humility, which was in fact the very virtue that um, sustained and helped the first century church to thrive and flourish. And this was all based around Philippians 2, 8, and 9, the idea that Jesus himself um, really exampled for us and modeled for us divine humility. And so the book is available right now. If you've ever felt anxious, um, if you are worried about what other people feel or look about you, I mean, if you've had any type of insecurities really at all in your life and it has robbed you of peace, the secret to the peace that you've been longing for is this ancient virtue that has for far too long been neglected, the virtue of humility. Uh, the Hidden Peace is available on Amazon and all the major book retailers where you would normally get it. You can also get a copy from Proverbs 31 Ministries, the P31 bookstore, uh, which is where I serve as Director of Theology. Um, and I'll have a link in the show notes for you as well. I pray that this book would be an encouragement for you as you grow and you learn how to cultivate the soil of humility, which is in fact the soil in which all the fruit of the Spirit of Galatians 5 uh, flow from. Blessings to you, friends. So uh, let's just turn to the text really quickly. We see the reality of an unbroken image within the very witness of Scripture. So this is not a um, 
a position that comes outside of the biblical text that I'm trying to argue for, that Kilner argues for. It is a position that actually comes from within the biblical text. Uh, we see the reality of an unbroken image before the fall and after the fall. So Genesis 1, 26 and 27, humanity made in the likeness and image of God. But then throughout human history after the fall, fascinating, humans are still said to be image bearers of God. Here are the cross-references. You can look up um, Genesis 9-6. Uh, Genesis 9-6. Um, Whoever sheds the blood of man, by man shall his blood be shed. For God made man in his own image. Right? Um, you could look at 1 Corinthians 11-7. For a man ought not to cover his head, since he is the image and glory of God. Right. You also have um, James chapter three, verse nine. With it, we bless our Lord and Father, and with it, we curse people who are made in the likeness and image of God. Now, notice none of these verses, none of these um, scripture references indicate a condition of this image that. We are the broken image, the effaced marriage, the um, the thirty percent image. It just says that okay, you're made in the image of God, and then finally in the eschaton, in the new heavens and the new earth, First John three two, um, that um, that that we are God's children, um, and that uh, and that we will be reflective of the very image of God Himself. So it seems scripture is actually incredibly clear in terms of the, I'm going to use a theological phrase here, ontological status of humanity. So ontology is just the state of being, the, the, the study or the position of something that is as it is. It is, um, it, it is um, yeah, it is present. It is the state of being. And so uh, when it comes to the status of humanity, their ontological, true, authentic, most clear status of, uh, of humanity, they are made in the image of God. So here's what I would suggest, that the image of God, is permanent, unchangeable, and incapable of being lost. It is very much the very essence of who we are as humans. The status of being in the likeness and in the image of God is something that has been very graciously given to us. Um, that is a gift that can't be revoked. I'm quoting a bit here from an um, article from Stephen Roy. I think it's helpful. Ultimately, the status of the image of God is bestowed rather than earned. Um, and so if the status of the image of God could be achieved, it seems like it would be done through some sort of moralistic behaviors, visible and notable characteristics, and through achievements that may or may not exist within a person. And yet, like the scripture references that I've kind of looked at, um, that doesn't seem to be the indication. So this leads me to the second thing. If the image of God is unbroken, um, but humanity is broken, then how does this fit with the reality of sin in the world and unrighteousness and injustice and evil? Well, this is the second point. The image of God is a standard that is freely given, can't be taken away, can't be revoked, but with that standard comes a status. Again, indebted to Dr. Kilner for this language. To say that we are in the image of God as a status is to say that we have been given something that is an irrevocable gift. The status is who we are ontologically, in, in the truest sense of who we are. We're made in the image of God. This is what separates us, humanity, all of humanity, regardless of ability or disability, regardless of ethnicity or social class or status or where we're born or who we're born to. Like, um, uh, regardless of all of that, if you are human, you're in the image of God fully. Um, with that image comes a responsibility. So we have the status, and that status requires a standard that we are to, that we ought to be living up to because um, humanity is broken the great tragedy of the fall is that we are now unable to live up to the status that we bear okay so when we talk about 
standard, um, uh, we're, we're talking about the expectation that's placed on humanity to act out in obedience and in accordance to their status as image bearers of God. So the categories of humanity's involvement and actions in all of creation. So think about how we act in politics, how we act in business, what are what our work is in the arts and the creative world, in any and every sphere of human existence. All of our human action and interaction ought to reflect the image of God that we have as a status that requires our work in these various areas to live up to that standard of the image. So at the fall, the image of God stays unbroken um, because it's graciously given to us. However, the standard of being able to, um, the standard of the image that we bear uh, comes with this um, difficulty now, right? Because if our status is in the image of God, our standard, our ability to live up to it is uh, now impeded. So during the fall, because of because the human breaks, he's unable to meet the standard. Uh, this finally brings us to kind of the um, trajectory of biblical scripture and the necessity for Jesus in the incarnation. Jesus is not simply in the image of God. Jesus is, in fact, the exact imprint of God. He is the very image of God who is the perfect representation of the status. Um, and, um, and, and he upholds every ounce of the standard that comes with that status. Therefore, right, this is the hope that you and I have as believers. When we are in Christ Jesus, this image of God that we bear is upheld, it's honored, and through the indwelling work of the Holy Spirit, we are working out our sanctification in regard to the standard that is required. Um, why does all this matter? Because we do live in a world that is broken. We do live in a world where sin has absolutely broken our humanity. And as a result of that, we have all kinds of issues with our bodies. Creation itself is falling apart. Um, we have natural disasters and chaos and, and confusion that is taking place inside of this world. And, um, and so uh, with that comes a deception of the enemy to corrupt our worldview and our ethics into a belief system that certain people are less than, not as valuable as others because of their ability or their inability. Um, if we view that the image of God is broken in humans, it is a short step into believing that certain people have more of the image of God and certain people have less of the image of God. Well, who determines who has more of the image or less than the image? The trajectory of human history has suggested that those in power are typically the ones who are able to justify that they're the ones that have more of the image. Why? Because they're in positions of power. They're the ones who are able to make such a suggestion. And those who are powerless, the persecuted and the oppressed, are the ones who bear less of the image of, the God, of God. Why? Because they're not in power, because they're not in that situation, because they are the recipients of the persecution and the oppression. And this creates chaos. This is an undermining of God's intent and ideal for his good creation. But if we hold to a theological position that the image of God is, is unbroken, that the image of God stays fully as a status that is um, irrevocable, and we acknowledge, no, absolutely, humanity is broken. <laughs> and because humanity is broken, this is the reason and the rationale for how sin has absolutely um, despoiled shalom, the, the peace that God... Is, intended for creation. And, and, and so because of sin, because of the brokenness of humanity, now we've got the why behind um, addictions and disabilities and, and, and cognitive delays and, um, and, and the presence of evil, such as racism and all this other stuff. Like, like now we know the why behind it by upholding the biblical doctrine and this theological truth that regardless of the broken humanity, you still have the status of being an image bearer by nature. Um, by demand, we as believers in Jesus, the risen Messiah, are now put in a position to uphold the inherent dignity and worth of all image bearers, regardless, regardless 
of their ethnicity, social class, status, inability, or ability, their disability, or any kind of delay, whether it be cognitive or physical. Like, like you realize now, this is a true and ideal picture of God's kingdom. This is present in the New Testament. This is present in the Old Testament. This is the trajectory of anthropology, uh, the study of humanity, in light of what God's ideal is for his creation. Um, and so this has weight because it works itself out in our ethics. It works itself out in our understanding of relationships. And so um, my humble suggestion here is that we ought to view every image bearer, every human. If you're human, you bear God's image. That cannot be stripped from you. And, and with this is a fundamental truth. We ought to fight to uphold inherent dignity and worth of all all humans in all of earth because we're all connected we all reflect we are all um, flowing from the life of yahweh the life of god who created us in his image 